Hi to our global audience on live stream. If you'd like to share today, don't forget hashtag WEF23. Also, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this panel, so you can all join in, of course. Uh, just grab me. I'll have someone bring around a microphone for you. Of course, we're here today not to talk about the stigma, discrimination, and repression that queer people continue to face around the world. We're here to talk about the success stories, so the best practice, some great examples from around the world and how to implement this type of thinking and uh, give people like me the opportunity to work in a safe workplace. When I jump on a flight anywhere around the world as a journalist in my work capacity or private life, I have to brief my boyfriend, tell him not to hold my hand. <laughs> to particular countries. You know, there are things that you have to think about uh, that other couples may never have thought about in their lives. Um, but again, we're here to talk about the positives and the progression that we're making uh, to give you an idea of how you can make a difference as well in your company, for your workforce, for yourselves, how you can change lives and change the world to a certain extent. So let me introduce you to our panelists studying at the far right for you, Fahad Jamaladin, Global Shaper from Lebanon, Sarah Kate Ellis from GLAD, Turana Hassan from Human Rights Watch, and Sharon Marcel from BCG Boston Consulting Group. Let me start with Turana. Could you tell us about the progression that is being made? around the world, to give people an overview, first of all. Sure. I mean, if we want to look at the long arc of history, um, we have made some significant progress. Uh, in 2008, Human Rights Watch did a report looking at the colonial origins of sodomy laws around the world. And back then, we had identified you know, 80 countries which had very repressive laws on the books. And now we find ourselves at a point where that's down to 70. Um, which is some level of progress. And in the last year, even, we've seen that there have been some very practical steps that have been taken. Uh, Singapore is one of the most recent examples that has decriminalised. Um, uh, it's actually decriminalised... Um, it's taken the legislation off the books, but at the same time, Singapore fortified the rules around same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not always a win. And they did that because they were playing to the more conservative base, which was agreeing to decriminalisation, but still wanted to embrace sort of the more conservative parts of the country's um, population. Uh, we've also seen progress in the Caribbean. We had three countries uh, across the Caribbean who all have uh, decriminalised and taken steps for decriminalisation. What I would say in relation to these steps is that, you know, the democratic institutions, like the courts, countries where they function, are fundamentally important f to actually bring about the change that we need to see, to deliver on structural long-term change. Um, and I think, you know, across the world, we still see that um, same-sex activity is outlawed in 67 countries. So that's, that just indicates to us that, you know, this is not a fight that is over. We still need to be, you know, vigilant and continue to progress. One thing I want to talk about in terms of just the climate that we're in, there is progress. It is a good, there is good news in this. However, we do need to be very careful that here we are in a point, at a point in time where, you know, LGBT rights, um, marriage equality laws, all of these issues are actually becoming signs of modernity. They are becoming signs of, you know, democracies and countries which, which respect rights for everyone. But we're seeing also that this has become a new battleground. And in particular, you know, this isn't something that happens in, you know, certain parts of the world and not others. Even in, you know, in Europe, we see Hungary in particular and Poland who have really try, been using LGBT rights um, as, a, as, a, as a battleground essentially to try and harness the support of the conservative um, elements of society and 
the government using it to put themselves up as some sort of hero, of protector of family values and rights. And that is not only divisive, um, it also encourages, um, it has been known to be linked to acts, increased acts of violent, uh, violence um, and discrimination. Tirana, so, can I just ask, when you say the courts are so vital, sure. a, a lot of lawyers are very liberal thinking. Am, am I wrong in that case? In, in, in many countries, is it a case that you have very conservative uh, courts where uh, the change needs to come from politicians, first of all, or from the people? Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, it's not one solution for each. But I think what we have seen is that, you know, all over the world, you can, you can challenge the constitutional basis. We have international law, for example, and that's been one of the great progressions over time, is we've seen LGBTQI rights actually emerge in, in, in bodies of international law. So we've been able to use these, and where countries have signed on to their commitments, be able to actually challenge repressive laws that are on the books um, within constitutional courts or supreme courts. So, you know, there are certainly some courts which are less free, but I think that as we develop domestic bodies of law and international law, we're going to be able to utilise that to be able to see long-term structural change. Fahd, could I ask you about lessons learned from Lebanon? Sure. I think, um, first, I want to uh, share more awareness. I think it's very important as an Arab to be on this panel, uh, uh, primarily because the narrative has been always uh, uh, been different. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we've been portrayed as queer people, uh, we've been portrayed in a way that has been always um, um, uh, uh, based on Islamic homophobia and uh, really uh, different values. Uh, but I think, uh, but I think uh, the narrative of queer Arabs is changing, definitely it's changing. And one of the main reasons why it's changing, because I think the literature, a lot of people are writing, a lot of people are sharing. I think in the Arab region as well, we have new media outlets through technology uh, uh, that, uh, that, that is also providing more platform uh, uh, for, for, for different people to share for their authentic voices. Uh, but I think it's very important not to whitewash. I think there is a huge reality in the region that we should not um, uh, escape from. Uh, uh, although a lot of countries are really progressing very fast, uh, 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 and, and I've, without naming these countries, but until now, uh, these countries uh, unfortunately criminalize um, people with, uh, who identify as LGBT. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's also it's very interesting to see how some global reports talk about that this country is the safest country, one of the safest countries in the world. Uh, However, people who identify uh, uh, as, as LGBT uh, can have a death penalty. So, so I think it's, it's very important to uh, be very uh, realistic uh, and also at the same time speak about the, the good things that, that are happening uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, the legal aspect and the, uh, and the whole court system. I think in 2018 in Lebanon, uh, although we uh, criminalize within the system, we've seen uh, 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 and brilliant uh, judges who have uh, go, went through loopholes within the system and made sure that people are, are safe. Uh, it's so, sad that we have to use loopholes. Yeah, it's very sad. But it's if, very sad. if that's the way we have to take, then sure. What, what is bringing about change then? What, what you, you said there is change in the Middle East. What, what's sparking that? Mm. I think, uh, I think, I think the, I, I would definitely would say the youth and the, the younger generation. Okay. Because the younger generation is not anymore uh, st structured within within specific circumstances. They have they have the tools, they have the means. They are creating spaces uh, for themselves to 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 claim that they are here. Uh, 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 but unfortunately, I, I mean, it's 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 very complex. I would say it's within even our region because every time you say something that's positive, there are so many things that are that are negative. Even when these youth are are, are claiming their spaces. Uh, uh, there's so much uh, uh, efforts uh, from uh, 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 extremist religious groups, from different people, to try to shut down uh, these these spaces. But I think uh, I, I think the voices of the people, and specifically the voices of the youth, will will continue be there, and I think will will always have uh, uh, more uh, uh, microphones and megaphones for at, at least like this platform. I would say. Well, Sarah Kate, that brings me to you. Is there if there is public resistance, is there some sort of 
private incentive for companies to bring about change? Uh, well, thank you for asking that because I do think corporations have played a big role and can continue to play a bigger role and need to, honestly. And it's being demanded by this next generation as well. So if you're in a, cor if you're in a, a, a CEO position, this next generation expects you to speak up and speak on these. Now, as you mentioned, it's very, we've been so politicized as LGBTQ people that it's in the ether, it's in the culture. Culture. And so where corporates used to speak out and speak up, they're, I'm, I'm just speaking from what I'm hearing here um, during this um, conference, which is they're nervous about speaking out. And so what I've been talking to them about is how can we use quiet diplomacy? There are so many things that you can do behind the scenes to advance safety for the LGBTQ community that can be done without being out in the media. That is a really important part too. I don't wanna diminish that. And it's critical, especially because as it gets polarized, that's a way to fight back, is to be public. Um, and I do think that corporates behind the scenes have been using that. In the United States, a lot of times, you know, when you were saying, like, we're seeing, it's, I think we're 18 days into the new year, and we've seen over 100 anti-LGBTQ bills proposed already um, in the United States, 100. Last year, there was more than 300 anti-LGBTQ bills. Most of them are targeting trans youth, um, which is a tactic. Um, they have the smallest amount of share of voice, so we have to be speaking up and out for them. Um, and they're, so my point in that is that we've worked with a lot of corporates behind the scenes to call in those states to say, I'm not, I'm gonna pull business. I'm not, I need safe places for my employees. And um, we've also seen employees in countries where it is illegal create, use their space almost as an embassy, if you will, as a safe space in there. And those are tougher for sure and, they, and they're nuanced. Um, and I've spoken with CEOs who have made the calls themselves to LGBTQ employees in those spaces and places to say, here's how we're gonna do this. What do you need? Um, so it can get very personal um, at a level. Sharon, you have 30,000 employees at BCG. Yes. What sort of change have you seen by introducing or supporting the community? Sure. So I run North America, so I, I'll come with uh, particularly a North American perspective. But I think, look, you, as you said, there is an expectation. We have a lot of, I call them less tenured employees, mm -hmm. but younger employees. And there's a real um, expectation of this generation mm -hmm. that we speak out. So we do speak out. And it's not just in reaction to, mm -hmm. to things. It's proactively, which mm -hmm. is really important. Showing up, showing up in forums like this is, is super important. Contributing, contributing intellectual property mm -hmm. um, is, is also critical. So I think there's, there's an increased expectation um, of our employees overall and certainly of the next generation in terms of, of what we do. Maybe I can offer just a few examples mm -hmm. from BCG. Definitely. Look, and I, I want to put out there first, we are not perfect. There's a lot of room for improvement, but maybe. So we've been on this journey a long time. Um, and by a long time, I would say 25 years in supporting the community. So back in 1998, um, we launched our, we call it the Pride Network. We launched our first Pride Network in, a, in many markets. But today, we actually have a Pride Network, over 1,000 employees actively contributing to the Pride Network, and it's in 45 countries around the world, which I think is terrific. Another example from many years ago, 30 years ago, we had domestic partner benefits. Um, and we've continued to build on this inclusiveness. And just this year, um, we, we, we offered two new benefits, one, an enhancement on gender affirming care, and secondly, um, an enhancement in terms of um, inclusiveness in, in um, fertility. So we, we continue to explore every year. We continue to learn and, and, and try to improve. But here's the truth. There's a war for talent. Everyone talks about the war for talent. Yeah. There's a war for talent, and we have to be the best place to work mm. for this community so they come 
and they stay and they can be their best selves. So just explain a Pride Network. We recently set one up at Deutsche Welle as well. It's a fantastic opportunity. I know how to benefit from it, but how do employees benefit from it? I think it's a source, I mean, it, it can be a source of many things. It can be a source of support, information, navigation, how to build mentorship. It can just be a practical source of, you know, what should I work on? How do I, how do I build my career to be a, a senior person in this company? But it's, um, it's a network that really, you know, whether it's at the New York level or the North American level or the Mid-Atlantic level, I mean, it's a network that really, and we, we, a thousand members, but then we have three times, four times that many allies, active allies, not people who are just allies, but active allies. So it's very important. Sarah, back to you. How do you then broach this public-private relationship and, and the dialogue? Yeah, I mean, I, I really encourage this, this forum this week is about collaboration. And I always say, don't go out alone. Utilize your civil society partners um, and, and establish those partnerships. And especially in spaces that where it's illegal, we are all connected in the LGBTQ community. So we would help you find the right people on the ground to advise you in that culture. It's really important that you're acting within the culture that you're in and you're speaking within the culture that you are. But. Um, and I think it's what you mentioned about getting ahead of it instead of coming behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding the cultural landscape and playing out from a PR standpoint what's going to could happen or not happen. Um, but you have to do it um, because it's demanded now, it's expected. And I think it's, you know, also I just wanted to make a mention of, as we're talking about examples, I worked with WEF and we had this project called The Lighthouses, which is online. And we ended up choosing eight best practice, business best practices of DEI and how to integrate that into companies all over the world. So we looked at tons of submissions and then we looked at the ways, we had really strict criteria for looking at how this made societal change. Not only made the company better, but made societal change. And so those are a great place when you're looking for, how do I bring this to my company? Um, the, those are best practices that are available through the WEF um, that, that a group of us worked really hard on selecting and um, were submitted by corporations. So basically a company doesn't have to go it alone. Don't go, go please don't go it alone. I mean, I think that's when you find, if you see missteps and that are blown up in the press, that company nine out of 10 times or 10 out of 10 times went it alone and didn't speak to the community that it's representing and what would be best for the community. Because sometimes we actually don't want you to speak out. There's quiet diplomacy going on behind the scenes. Public pressure actually could backfire. So you have to understand what's at stake and what's happening in order to really make a move properly. Fad, what about the next frontier in the Middle East? How is this going to progress, do you think? Uh, uh, I think the, the context is very challenging. And also, I mean, speaking from, from, from Lebanon, um, the, the challenging thing is really the culture. I think this is the first thing that we need to think of rather than the policy. Mm. Uh, uh, because, because we've seen a lot within Lebanon, we have, uh, I think we're one of the most uh, highest inflation rate across the world uh, in, in 2022, uh, the economic crisis, the Beirut blast, 200 people died. We have no justice until now. So when you talk about this to the people, they would say, what are you talking about? There's a more other priority areas. And I think this is, this is a huge, uh, challenge how to shift this narrative that's not uh, it's not about polarization and what what's the best priority now and I think uh, this is not only in Lebanon in, 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 in globally today we're seeing a huge revolution on uh, on on climate and climate change because this is an existential crisis right but I think the topic we are speaking about now today is also an existential crisis mm. there are so many people that are fighting to live they are, that they are thinking if they should uh, sp speak up or not, uh, millions of students in the schools not feeling safe. I mean, I think we also we need to leverage and create more tools that would help shift the narrative, shift the culture, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is the entry point. Tirana, how do you convince people that this is a basic human right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that actually it's the LGBT community as a whole who's actually led this fight, you know. But, you know, we've been talking about what are the solutions and it's not just a legal fight. It's not the, the realisation of these rights isn't going to just come from the creation of strong laws and challenges in the courts. It also is about changing societal opinion. It's about challenging discriminatory views. It's about making sure that people are seen in the mainstream media in day-to-day -day life. And I think that's another opportunity where we have the corporate world to play a really important role. It's in the, as, as one of our colleagues said in another forum that we were in the other day, the hearts and minds part of this. And that is to make LGBT um, pe people, the community visible when you are talking about your product, you know, visible in your imagery. Um, you know, we can make sure that your products are centered towards them. And so I think that that is an important part of it. And I also want to talk a little bit around what corporates can do in terms of actually making sure your products are safe. I mean, we, I'm thinking about the Middle East and actually there's a really interesting uh, developments that were taken, for example, um, by Grindr who actually then developed and made amendments to the app so that photos could be recalled, that there were extra security. That this is a dating app. This is a dating, dating app, dating. sorry. And, you know, they, they can, you can actually take steps that ensure that you're keeping people safe from the threats that they're going to face. And, you know, we should just point out that you know, there are currently, it's not just um, the rights of the community that are under assault. There are, there is a very dangerous law on the books at the moment. It's, um, I believe it's a private member's bill in Ghana that is particularly problematic where it's going to make it pretty much impossible to, to talk about uh, being gay, lesbian, uh, or even to advocate on these issues. And actually part of the danger of this legislation is that it could also hold social media platforms responsible for disseminating information. So, you know, we need to make sure that uh, in this instance that we have the platforms that are, you know, telling these stories, that are disseminating information. This is a really important point in time where we expect, where it would be helpful for the corporations in that space to be able to stand up, mm -hmm. to be able to articulate public positions um, uh, to, the, to the government. Sharon, how do you juggle being in so many countries and having to have so many policies when it comes to LGBTQI plus rights? Well, I mean, one consistent policy we have is we support our people. So no matter where we are, are working, whether we're working in India or, or Singapore, or, you know, we have a common purpose and a common set of principles where we support, we, we believe in a common set of things across BCG, mm -hmm. and we support our people, in, in, including especially our pride community. And in fact, you know, my dear friend and head of Asia, Niraj, um, you know, almost as, I don't want to say more, but he's more, he's almost more vocal than me because, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's a voice that needs to be heard, you know, in, in, in parts of the world that he's in charge of. And so, you know, of course, how we interact with the government, how we interact, you know, in terms of what we can say, what we, is going to be different. We have more latitude in some place like the United States mm -hmm. or Canada. Um, but Mexico, which um, you know, we have we have the same benefits in Mexico that we do uh -huh. uh, in the U.S. So we support our people equally, although what we can do externally is different. Mm -hmm. And just let me know what sparked the movement back 25 years ago at your company. Some companies are only just thinking about it today. 25 years ago, we had leadership that was gay, openly gay. Um, you, you know, I, I don't know why. I don't know why. I joined BCG from Goldman Sachs. It was, it was, it was a different, open, inclusive culture. It, you know, maybe it was our founder, Bruce Henderson, but it, it sort, it, it just was, and it is. You know, I, I don't, I, I didn't create it, but I benefited from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, yeah, it was wonderful. Wonderful. But still, I mean, still many of our people um, from you know, diverse backgrounds you know, still struggle to show up as their best selves. So there's still a lot more work we need to do. What else can we give our audience? Uh, well, I was going to say a really good model to look at is 
in the United States how we did marriage equality. Uh -huh. Because that's a right, right, that we were fighting for. But what moved people was the emotional part about it. It's like when we stopped talking about it as a right and we started talking about it as love, mm -hmm. um, it completely shifted the conversation and the public opinion on it. Um, but also, it was a coming together of everyone to get that done, you know? And it started with a few, and then more and more and more came on. And so, as someone who, at GLAAD, we worked with Grindr on that, and we work with a lot of the dating apps to make sure they're safe spaces globally. Um, visibility is the key here, because rights Visibility, I always say, lays the groundwork to move rights forward. And until you build acceptance, until you're safe just walking down the street being who you are, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether or not you have rights. It does, and, it, and, and we need to move that forward. And the way that we move that forward is by people knowing who we are. And in, and in places where it's illegal and punishable by death, you can't do that. That is a real risk, right? A, a serious risk. So how can we infiltrate or work with media, corporations who put information out to get the word out, to bring visibility? Because if you don't know who we are, then, we, then you're, usually you're fearful of what you don't know. But once you meet someone or you see somebody, and so you know that's something that we're combating in the US, is that only 16% of US people say that they know someone who's transgender. So who's making up the gap in education? Media. And right now, because that community is being so targeted and the, the media is picking up those stories, it's really sending the wrong mm. message about who those folks are. Um, so I think that there are other ways that, that corporates can play a role in this that are, might be different, especially in countries where it's illegal. Lucas, I'll get you to uh, bring around the microphone for a moment and we'll open up uh, the Q&A. But is there anything else you guys would like to uh, highlight before we go to questions? I think I just want to highlight something that's very important, and um, which is when we are talking about queer struggle, it's important to connect it within the context, as you have already said. Um, and I think the queer struggle, at least in the country that I, co I come from, in the region that I come from, is also connected to the Palestinian uh, struggle. It's also connected yes. to uh, a lot of struggles, the migrant workers, the women. The, yeah. So, so uh, it's very important to take it as a whole uh, uh, and not only focus on just one piece out of it, because I think we would miss a lot of uh, steps. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anyone with a question in the audience that would like to ask our panelists something at the back? Hi, um, uh, I uh, run a large media company and I would just like for you to unpack a little bit more uh, what media specifically can do, specifically news media, because it's a, it's a blanket statement and I, very interested in finding out what it is that can happen. Yeah, I think, you know, it is, so it's really important right now in, in the context of um, the community for education and telling the story. So news media can do many things. It can highlight and profile LGBTQ people that bring to the forefront the struggles that we're facing and, and put a face to what that struggle looks like. So interviewing a family who might have a trans child, I don't think putting trans kids in front of the camera is, a, is the right thing to do. I think putting the family members and caretakers of those folks in front of the camera and telling their stories so that people can relate and understand understand who they are, raising awareness around, using your platform to raise awareness on the 67 countries that it's still illegal and the ones that are punishable by death, that folks, just for being who you are, um, you could be killed. Um, and normal, you know, um, normalizing LGBTQ folks including us in all stories. So that's the other piece that I think is really important. And we've worked really closely with Hollywood on this. It's not just centering the story on us, but it's we're everywhere, right? We're at your workplace. We're in your families. We're at your laundromat. We're at your grocers. We're everywhere. 
So why aren't we everywhere in the stories being told? Um, and I think bringing our perspective and us as people into just everyday stories um, and putting that lens on it could, is a great place to start too. So profiling perhaps a, a gay CEO, but profiling their work and being gay is the side story. Yes. Um, showing that this is a normal person. Yeah. Um, what about in education as well? A completely different kettle of fish. I know my sister has uh, received praise from one family where she was uh, really responsible for ensuring that the classroom was supportive of a trans child. Mm -hmm. And it was a real struggle for this kid. But primary school, so from grade one to grade seven in Australia, was a breeze for this kid because of what the teacher did. What, what, I mean, I, the... may I just say one thing on that? Because that is a battleground that we're facing in the United States right now. Yeah. It is, uh, it's really tough, I'll be honest with you. Um, there's, um, they're putting it under parental rights. I'm a parent, I'm married to a woman and I have two kids. So they're talking about some parental rights um, and they're excluding us and they're targeting us and they're banning books at a rate that we've never seen before. Um, and I think it is, and they're conflating these conversations about bodily autonomy and trans youth. Um, and it's, it's a really tough moment right now in education in the United States. And I'm absolutely sure it's being exported globally, this kind of um, framework that they've come up with that's been really effective over the past year. And they're legislating against it as well. Tirana, can you give us any advice for that sector? I mean, well, I think that actually it's not so much just about the education sector, it's about keeping track of where the political narrative more broadly is going. So when you start seeing the othering of the community, that's when we need to start mobilising. That's when you need to start reaching out to elected members. That's when actually all parts of society, not just the community, needs to start mobilising and becoming politically active. You know, I, what you said for is 100% right. This is a human rights issue. This is a broader human rights issue and we must situate it in that way. We should see the assaults on LGBT rights as an assault on human rights. And that's an assault on all of our rights. That's a constitutional issue, that's an individual rights issue. So, you know, don't wait until we're seeing it play out in the classroom, till you're waiting till children uh, be, they have license to be beaten up yeah. in but the playground. I have to say something when it comes to school, because I think there is so much happening on the ground that we're still not, or we're still failing to capture. Uh, when it comes to educators who are pushing different narratives, when it comes to principals who are also trying to leverage different tools. Uh, uh, I think, for, for instance, in, in the context that I come from, uh, these stories are there, but there's no access to these stories. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start telling these stories. We need to start produce more knowledge on it uh, uh, in order to make this uh, wheel move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th that's where the media comes back in. Again, that's where the community support and the connections between public and, and, and private come into effect. There's a question here. Thank you. Um, sorry for my voice. Um, my name is Francoise Mudote. I'm the CEO of the African Women's Development Fund based in Ghana. Mm. And I thank you so much for sharing that example. I just wanted to share uh, two invitations in relation to how um, we can work with the uh, LGBTQI and feminist movements, especially in the global south, who are doing that work of bringing, bridging the gap between, you know, centering this issue as a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. The first invitation, based on the example of Ghana, is to use the power that especially big um, companies have to be a force of resistance, because we can trace directly uh, the sourcing, the resourcing uh, for homophobia in Ghana straight line to the US uh, churches, and it, this has been documented in CNN like last month. And we don't have a, another force that, that balances it out. And I think there's, a, there's big companies that are based in Ghana and other countries that can play that role. And the second invitation is to work with and fund um, 
those movements, uh, either through uh, global or regional dedicated uh, feminist funds that do that work like Australia, Isdao in West Africa, Uha in Eastern Africa. This is so critical because their work is so dangerous and so underfunded. And I just think that there's a great amount of wealth and resources in this room that is not connecting to those movements. So just two invitations from Africa. Thank you. I mean, I would just comment on, um, on the resourcing part of this is that, you know, particularly in the global south and in countries that are particularly conservative where people do this work at extreme personal risk, um, you know, it goes back to how do you provide not only, you know, monetary resources, but also, you know, those safe spaces, those platforms to elevate the discussions where they can be safe. How do you also elevate them, not just at a local level, but elevate these voices to the global level? Um, so that, you know, states actually see that this is not just something, but restricting these rights or allowing violence against this community is not something that is just going to play to a domestic constituency, but this will have a ripple effect on our international standing as a country. Mm. Um, and you can, you know, I think that uh, we can do that in many different ways from many different sectors. Mm. So a country standing when it comes to investors, Right. Willing to put their money, their workforces in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Hello, uh, Kenneth Edwards uh, from the California Association for Licensed Professional Clinical Counselors. I'm based in San Francisco. As a black American, cis, LGBTQ male, I could only imagine what my ancestors and the people who came before me, my grandparents, my great grandparents, when they were going through the civil rights era, to live through another period of needing or wanting or deserving civil rights just makes you want to just stamp your feet and yell and scream. I love how we've advanced, but why, why can't we just do it? You know, <laughs> why do we have to have this conversation yeah. and negotiate who we are and what rights are and what we'll take and what we'll tolerate versus let's just stand up and do it? What stops that from happening? I think the best point I've heard this morning is the cultural aspect. Religion for so many people is set in stone. It's their faith. It's what they've been, been brought up with, what they believe. And there's no swaying from that from my personal experience, you know? So, yeah, I think there are, you know, we're built in a, we're working within a system that was built mm. to exclude us, right? It was, it was, it was created to p empower and build wealth for certain people and leave everybody else to do that at no cost, actually. Um, so I think that that's why there's a constant negotiation. Um, it, and you know, a lot of these younger activists are all about completely dismantling systemically how we are as a world put together. Um, and, and we're seeing that, that extremism on both sides, right? Um, and they want it for different reasons. One wants to keep it for power and one wants to dismantle it so that they can gain more access and power. So I think it's a really big question, but the way that we've been able to move things forward is through changing culture, changing hearts and minds, and moving policy forward. Um, and, and it's been very effective. Um, and there are, there are places where need, that need a lot of light shown on it, um, on the challenges that they're facing. Um, you're, uh, Yes, <laughs> we're with you. I, I think, I think um, maybe because of the, the narrative of this conversation is mainly focusing on the positive side, this is, this, is, this is maybe why this question is coming from. But the reality is very hard, let's face it. Uh, even if youth are, act, are activists going on the, uh, I mean, in Egypt, a couple of years ago, uh, Sarah Hijazi just yes. brought the flag in a concert and then she was tortured for months, went out of the country to, uh, to, to, to stay a bit safe, right? Uh, but she couldn't, she, couldn't, she couldn't survive. She committed suicide. So, so yes, we need to leverage youth, 
uh, but also we need to be smart how we can support these youth in this battle. Because it's very challenging, it's, it's very hard, and it's, um, uh, I think it's culture. This is, this is what uh, I think what we need to, to, to work on. No one should have to go it alone. Right. Yeah. Like I mean, can I just add something to that? Is it's not always about you know, progressing forward. We have to also defend what we have and the progress we've been made. If anything has the last couple of years in particular, we have seen how the world has become more polarised on most rights issues, but particularly this issue. And we need to be very careful that we are not taking our rights for granted and, and that we need to make sure that we are defending and expanding these rights on all levels. And, you know, we also need to ensure that, you know, we're aware of where... I've, I've used this word twice now, but it's the battlegrounds. But where are we being attacked from? You're not always going to see it. We can't only talk about the, you know, the outspoken extreme views that are trying to shut down legislate or push through conservative legislation. I mean, if you look at the sort of social media platforms that we all take for granted, for example, we, Human Rights Watch has just finished um, a body of research that's going to be released shortly that looks at how social media is actually being used and did to, to surveil LGBT communities across the Middle East. You know, and it's being used even, I think it was Egypt was the example, where they were using dating apps to actually bait Yes. men, um, and then putting them in prison where they were, you know, tortured, where they were beaten, where they, they've had unfair trials. We, 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 we're, we're unfortunately being more aware that this is also starting to happen in Lebanon, by the way, yeah. just one That's month right. ago. Uh, so uh, um, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough challenge. So, you know, I just think that in this particular, we need to be really acutely aware it's beyond what we see. We need to continue to make sure that we are looking at where the abuses are taking place and we're pushing back. We're ensuring that the right safety steps are being taken. Mm -hmm. We're ensuring that governments are accountable. Security services aren't using these sort of abusive tactics to, um, to essentially um, violate the rights of this community. Sharon, is there an, uh, a last word that you'd like to give? Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. I mean, I've learned so much. I've been listening attentively. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, at, at BCG, you know, I... You've done we, it all. We have, we've got a lot to do. I mean, we have you a lot to do. still have a lot to do? But we, sure, we have a lot to do. We have to continue to work on it every single day. And, um, and, and the environment is more, more challenging, frankly, than it was, you know, a few years ago. And so it's been a great learning opportunity for me. Thank you for including me and um, look forward to staying in touch with you guys. As we heard there, it's not just about progressing, it's about defending rights, especially at a time where there are so many other things that people are worried about and suddenly LGBTQ rights are just a sidebar. Uh, we also heard about decriminalization, marriage equality, that the courts are fundamental, but that companies contribute and can contribute. They can be a force of resistance, as we heard. Uh, quiet diplomacy is also possible in countries where it can be dangerous to speak up, but don't go it alone. Utilize civil society, as we heard from Sarah Kate. It's also not just a right, if, if this is the strategy you want to take, um, it's also about love. You know, really, when you get personal, people understand, ah, okay, okay, this guy's been having a rough past 47 years or however old he is. <laughs> uh, what can media do, okay? That's something I'm looking at every day in my job as a journalist and all you journalists should be thinking about as well. It's you really have to be careful about the words you use, the people you talk to and why. I, I'm fed up with just seeing a little short segment at the end of the news about a gay pride march and someone in a crazy wig. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's more than that. Uh, it's also about keeping track of the political narrative. So watching in your country which way things are going. Uh, reaching out to elected members. Also, considering that there are investors out there looking at countries' ratings when they're looking at setting up shop in your country. Uh, it's also, it also a lot of the time comes down to the cultural and religious thinking, and that is a very tough one, as well as the education center, uh, sector. Uh, but yeah, it's all about progressing and defending. I think that's my biggest takeaway today. 
But thank you very much for all of you. It was a fantastic session, and thank you for your questions. And I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of Davos. Uh, it's a very different World Economic Forum for me. Two panels on LGBTQ, uh, I plus rights, and also the first official LGBTQ I dinner, which I just hosted the other night. So uh, we're seeing progress here as well. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you.